Greetings, everyone. Rob Kastner here, continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Luke. And if you're following along, we're in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25 in this study. Now, even though we are nearly one half of the way through the Gospel of Luke, the history we're studying here includes the final months of the life of Jesus Christ. And so we're studying um, these verses, or as we study them, remember that Jesus is only just a short time uh, before his crucifixion. Matthew tells us that the scene which we're getting ready to read, happening, uh, it happened in an environment where there are sharp swords being exchanged between Jesus not swords, but words, uh, being exchanged between Jesus and the religious leaders. Uh, there is a guy in the crowd surrounding Jesus who is watching this event we are now introduced to, and so he's going to enter into this conflict. Now, the opening verses of this study indicate that this guy is a lawyer or an expert in the law, and in the first century, a lawyer was very different than what we know as a lawyer in modern day. He is not representing criminals in a court case um, or, or representing someone to file bankruptcy or divorce. This guy uh, would know the law um, and um, he was a lawyer in the sense of the religious laws of the Jews. He was a scribe. He would have made a living copying the word of God from one scroll to another, and that is all. And because this was his occupation, he would have had memorized the entire um, Torah. And if you wanted to know what the law said, you would find a guy like this who was known as a lawyer or an expert in the law. All right. Press pause. If you don't have your Bibles, I'll put the verses in the box below this video. Press pause, read verse 25, and then press play once again. It's very difficult uh, to determine, is this guy a good guy or a bad guy? We know that he is an expert in the law, yet there is some indications that this guy might not be all that sincere. We take note of the fact that he is standing up not because he seeks an answer to his question, but rather he is asking the, this question like, in order to tempt Jesus, this word test used here is used in other gospel scriptures as a very negative, uh, in a very negative way. Uh, you can find that in Matthew, sorry, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And so here you have this expert of the law who has heard Jesus and the religious leaders going back and forth. And this religious leader is likely thinking to himself, hey, this guy, Jesus really knows his stuff. This guy is really speaking the truth. And Mark's gospel tells us that after the scribe responded, Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, so Jesus is saying here to the scribe, you're really close to discovering the truth. So the, the scribe is likely still attempting to figure out in his own mind, how should he categorize Jesus? You know, should he categorize him as a false teacher or, uh, uh, or someone who knows the truth? And so this question is a test. He wants to see what Jesus knows. Is Jesus of Nazareth one who is leading me in the right direction? And notice that the scribe is not looking for grace. He's not looking for uh, forgiveness. He's not looking for mercy, but rather he's looking for a list of things to do. And when I am done checking off that list of things to do, I can have confidence that I'm going to have eternal life. What can I do to have eternal life? Now, typically, uh, of, of typical of Jesus, he answers a question with a question. So press pause, read verse 26, 27, and 28, and then press play once again. So Jesus
Jesus answers a question with a question, and notice that this guy knows the answer. That is exactly what the Bible says. The Bible tells us when you are in a right relationship with God that the fruit of being in that right relationship with God will produce love, compassion, tenderness towards other people. John the Apostle tells us in 1 John 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. So the fruit of God's spirit being active in a human being's life or the proof or the fruit, that is cause, that it causes us to be loving, merciful, gracious, um, in, in, in our behavior towards others. The only true evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life is that you are going to be a loving and merciful human being. And if the love of the Holy Spirit is not being demonstrated in your life, then there is a reason to believe that you do not know the God of the Bible. So Jesus tells this scribe, uh, you do know the Bible, now, this guy realizes that he is on the hook to love people. So the scribe has a heavy task in front of him. He is uh, to love other people. And so now he wants to qualify who, who is really the ones that he has to love. There are some people that each of us really don't want to love. And so here the scribe wants to justify who is really the ones that I need to lose. So press pause, read verse 29, and then press play once again. So, the, so this guy asks two questions. One, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's verse 25. And here in verse 29, he says, question two, who is my neighbor? Now, in this culture, the Jews taught that the only person qualified to be your neighbor was a fellow Jew. And they got out, uh, they got this out of the law because in Leviticus chapter 19 we read under the subtitle of love your neighbor so Leviticus 19 verse 17 and verse 18 you must not harbor hated hatred against your brother in uh, your heart directly rebuke your neighbor so that you will not incur guilt on account of him and then verse 18 do not seek revenge or bear a, a, a grudge against any of your people but love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. And so what the scholars of the law said, because of the fact that God says in one breath, you cannot hold a grudge against a fellow Jew, and then he said you are to love your neighbor, the scholars connected those two thoughts together and said your neighbor first and foremost was has to be a Jew. And if you have a Jew living on one side of you and a Roman on the other side of you, you only had to love you. one of your neighbors, the one that was Jewish, because technically speaking, a Roman is not a neighbor, even though he lives right next door to you, because he's not a Jew. And so in this culture, neighbor began, became this undefinable term. It became a cop-out for the Jews regarding loving unconditionally, all people and keeping them separated from the Gentile community. To them, they were able to question who is my neighbor. It is the guy who lives in the same, is it the guy that lives in the same county? Is it the guy who lives on the same street? Is the guy right next door? Now Jesus is going to give them the answer. So press pause and read verses 30 through 37 and then press play once again. This is one of the most familiar parables of Jesus Christ, and I am sure most Americans are familiar with this parable. Yet many of them likely do not know that this comes from the Bible. Most people could give a summary of what is the Good Samaritan. Now the road which leads from Jerusalem to Jericho was called the Bloody Way. It was one of the most notorious places for bad guys to hang out during this time in history. And if you were one of the bad guys or the robbers, you could easily escape from the scene of the crime. Uh, and so most Jews who would travel this road, they would travel in large groups 
for uh, for safety. And so <clears throat> this guy referenced in this parable uh, made the mistake of traveling by himself on the bloody way. And we notice here that he paid the price. Now you have to realize how offensive this parable would be or would have been to the first century Jew who was listening uh, to Jesus. Um, and, um, and so this is essentially what Jesus is saying. These people would have been enraged that Jesus was suggesting that one of the, these half-breeds, these Samaritans, would have been more righteous before God. This was a very big problem. The, the problem with Christianity is you could know the Bible so well that one, uh, that one just assumes that he is right with God. You know the events of the Bible. You know about Christian worship. And so uh, and it becomes so familiar that you're really not in the right relationship uh, with God. When you look at this, apparently Jesus is saying that your neighbor is anybody who is in need, anybody who is dwelling on this planet, and they are in need of grace or mercy. They are your neighbor. You bear, uh, you bear the responsibility before God to care for them. This guy was traveling alone, not something you would typically do in this environment. And I'm sure that this priest and Levite was thinking, well, you just can't be traveling on this road. So just chalk that one up to a, a lesson learned. This guy was just asking for trouble, made poor choices or poor decisions. And now he's suffering for those poor choices. And so why should I become a uh, part of this poor guy's poor decision and help him help this guy out? The irony here is that when you read this parable carefully, the priest and Levite are also traveling alone. Uh, and the only reason why they did not suffer from fate is because God was gracious and merciful to them. Now, how many times have you or I been guilty of doing the very same thing? God has mercy and grace upon us. And if God is, is merciful and gracious to us, why do we stand in judgment of another person? Jesus is telling us you are to be merciful to anyone who is in need of mercy, and you are to be gracious to anyone who needs grace. You have to ask yourself, why do we not get involved in other people's lives who are in need of grace and mercy from God? Uh, there has been a uh, there was a study conducted by two Princeton University psychologists in which they took a, a group of students, divided them into two two groups. They gave both groups the same amount of tasks. The first group they gave them an impossible time frame to do these tasks within. The second group was given plenty of time to complete the tasks. And what did they, uh, what they did was they strategically placed along the, the routes which the students would travel, people in desperate need. And the, the purpose of the study was to find out who stops to help and who does not. Uh, what they discovered was in the group that was pressed for time, less than 10% of the group stopped to help people who were in desperate need. And uh, out of the, the group who had plenty of time, over 70% of those that group stopped and helped people who were in desperate need. So this led the, the, uh, the researchers to the conclusion that there is a link between busyness, which, is, which we sense in life, and the willingness uh, to help another person in need. And if we are sensing that our schedule is packed and... Uh, then chances are that we will be a little or of little or no help to anyone else who is in need. It is not an issue of time. We all have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 52 weeks in a year, and we all have the same amount of time. Why is it that some people get involved and others do not? It is not about time, but rather it's an issue of priority. What I am making as my priority in my life. That's the issue. Am I establishing my schedule in life 
in such a way that if God brings a person in need of grace and mercy across my path, that I'm going to make myself available to help this person? Or uh, have we so filled our schedules with the urgencies of our own desires, then, then how can we say that we are right with God? How can we say that we are God's representatives to the needy world? We can only say those kinds of things when we are making the love of God and demonstrating the love of God as a priority in our lives. On, on the issue of busyness, Luke records another event to, to drive this point uh, this point home. Um, uh, press pause, read verses 38 and 39, and then press play once again. So over the course of time, Jesus had developed relationships with certain individuals and certain families. That is the way of life. You cannot be intimate friends with everybody. If we were to look at your life, there are certain people that you're very close to, and there are other people that you're only acquainted with. The very same thing happened in the life of Jesus, and apparently Jesus had an intimate relationship with his family in Bethany. And the family was made up of two sisters and a brother. Now, here we have Martha, and notice it tells us that Mar it was Martha's house. It doesn't say that Jesus went into their house. It says it went in, he went into Martha's house. She apparently is the elder sister, and she has a sister and brother living with her, and they're not really told, we're not really told how they became so close, but this is the brother Lazarus who Jesus raised from the dead. They could provoke an, uh, they could provoke an intimate relationship, and so uh, they were very close. Now, Martha was uh, the elder sister and she received Jesus. Now, what that means is uh, there was an invitation extended and now there is an invitation which is accepted. And so Jesus is not crashing a party, so to speak. He was invited as a guest. And so you've got Jesus and we can assume that there are 12, that the 12 disciples or apostles, the disciples are with him. And you've got, so you got 13 adults coming to this house for lunch. You got Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so you've got at least 16 people in the house for lunch or dinner. And so Martha is feeling the pressures of hospitality. Martha is getting things ready uh, for all of these folks for a meal. And then she realizes that she is the only one getting ready for this meal. And the others, the others are sitting at Jesus's feet, listening to Jesus speak. And now it all comes to a head. Press pause, read verse 40, and then press play once again. She calls Jesus Lord, yet Martha is the one, uh, the only one doing the bossing around, so to speak. She's bossing Jesus. She's bossing the one who came to this earth so that he could shed his blood for the likes of you and me. And she's accusing this same person of not caring. This is an example of how sick and twisted human nature can uh, can be. And so you have this big argument uh, in the middle of this Bible study that Jesus is leading. This is likely a good indicator that these people had a very close and casual relationship with Jesus. The reason I believe that is if you do not know someone very well and you're invited for lunch or dinner, not only are you going to uh, serve a nice meal, but also I will put on my best behavior and you're going to end up thinking that I never yell at my kids or my wife or I never cross anybody and everything I think, say and do is so godlike. Why? Because you don't know me yet. Uh, you might throw me out uh, of a boat if you really knew uh, who I was, but yet if we know one another for years and we have a close relationship, then nothing is held back. Martha did not hold back from Jesus, and so Jesus likely knew this family well, and uh, they're comfortable together, and uh, they are actually, uh, they have a sister-on-sister -sister fight. 
right in front of, uh, of Jesus. All right, press pause, read verse 41, and then press play once again. So Martha is freaking out, running all over the place. She's doing uh, her compulsive activities. Jesus is cool and calm. Uh, likely he's chuckling uh, as, he, as he responds to her. You know, take a chill pill, Martha. Uh, she was obviously a very controlling personality. And if you're a controlling personality, you know who you, you know, why you are the way you are, because honestly, you believe that if you're not in control, then the things are not going to get, get done or turn out correctly. Uh, so there is a sense that if I do not do it, uh, it is not going to get done correctly. And so um, uh, we want to stay in charge. One of the most insightful things which John the baptizer tells us, which is recorded in the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, uh, at the end of verse 20, he says, openly declared, I am not the Christ. Okay, you can read those verses when you press pause. Uh, and But the, the important words there, he says, I am not Christ. And that, of course, Christ is a title, Messiah, the one who saves. Uh, that is the greatest truth that each of us has to learn. We are not the Messiah. We do not control everything. We do not save the world. If the world is going to be saved. It is going to be saved by only one party, and that is Jesus Christ, and not by the likes of you and me. And so, Martha, you're just so worried, but you have no peace. All right, press pause now and read verse 42, and press play once again. All right, why has God saved you? Why has God revealed himself to you? Human nature gets the idea that God needs an army of servants. Uh, uh, you know, why, why did you get married? Why did you have children? If you got married because you wanted someone to do your dishes, uh, or if you had children because you wanted someone to cut the lawn, don't expect to have a very good relationship with your spouse and your children. We get married and we have children because we want to share our lives with other people. We want to share our lives. We want to share experiences with one another. And the same thing is true with the Lord Jesus Christ. He created you and me and he saved you and me so that he could have a relationship with you and me for eternity. Jesus just wants to share life with you. Jesus wants to love you. This week, as you go through your life, Jesus wants you to open yourself up that you can share your experiences with him. Ask yourself, um, are you sharing your life with Jesus Christ? Uh, you know, the message, the message that we have goes way beyond uh, uh, the local and the international news broadcasts and Facebook and Fox and politics and uh, our culture. You know, the message of the scripture is your creator loves you. And all your creator wants to do is share his life with you. He wants you to open up your life so that you might be by his hands and by his feet in this world, which is a lost, dark place. And there will be, from time to time, people who will be crossing your path uh, who, who need to be hugged, who need to be delivered from a financial issue, who need to be counseled, on what they need to do. And God has strategically placed those people in your path, in your life, so that you can demonstrate the love of God to that person. So focus this week on uh, the great things which God has done for you and for me and the message which he has given to us, which is to carry forth in practical ways of loving God and loving one another. Amen. I hope this has been helpful and informative. 
please feel free to share this video with anyone who will benefit. Thank you for viewing. Our next study will be Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Thank you for viewing and good day.